So this is what's going to be different today about flying. So in a single seat, the best thing I can do initially is brief. And the next thing is going to be communicate effectively in the cockpit. And I call that C3. Clear, concise, and correct communication. You need all three. Two of the three isn't going to get you to where you need to be. Most pilots don't understand what career opportunities are available in the world of aviation. They're making career decisions based on advice from friends or posts on internet forums. Meaning they are taking huge risks with their livelihood without having all the details. This podcast was created to help you understand the aviation industry so you can find your dream job. Let's get ready for pushback. Here's your host and my dad, Nick Fialka. Hey, pilot. It's Monday. It's another interview. It's a great Monday. Your Monday is going great too because you already found the podcast and it's only going to get better. Today is another interview prep session that I did with my friend Derek. Derek is a very generous guy who I met uh, prior to going to the OBAP conference in 2022. This is one of those recorded on the floor OBAP episodes. I've had a lot of positive feedback from these and I am glad people like them. When I go to the conventions, I try to do a little bit of recording and I'll do some on the spot interview prep. If somebody has something coming up that they were not expecting and they need a little bit of polishing, this is what I do. I sit down with them. I spend the time. I ask them questions, give them feedback, help them come up with uh, ways they can articulate themselves. And this is what we do at Spitfire. We do precision interview coaching all virtually. This is just an in-person version. If you can get past the background noise from being on the convention floor, it's kind of like watching an episode of Antiques Roadshow or something like that. That's what I always liken it to. But you will get a lot out of this. If you are not yet a Spitfire client and you are considering and you're trying to figure out what things you should be talking about, listen to these questions and start forming your opinions and creating your stories. You've heard me talk about getting a notebook. And you should have that notebook and write down important things that are stories that can resonate. And this is how you get sharper. This is by no means any kind of shortcut. Me putting this out there is not the end all be all this. You should not use this as your interview prep. Please, please, please do not use this as your prep. This is a primer. This allows you to see what we do, but you need to get yourself into the hot seat. You need to practice your answers so that you can articulate yourself effectively. You need to think about that. It is so important. I did some interview prep with a person the other day and they had not been in the hot seat yet. They said they had been sitting and lurking and listening for a long time and they were ready to go. And you know what? Their answers were not good. We spent an hour and a half going through different questions. I'd ask a question, that person would answer. And at the end of it, we were on the struggle bus. And so if you are not interacting, you will also be on the struggle bus. Derek, actually, I did a ton of prep with him months prior to going to this convention. And we met for the first time while we were there. And you will hear how good he is able to articulate himself. And it's not because he went in there cold. It's because he had practiced, practiced, practiced. And then all of a sudden got a really cool opportunity to do an interview that he did not expect. And this is us getting ready. He's an awesome person. And I hope you find this really compelling and really interesting. If you are, go ahead and join my organization. SpitfireElite.com is the website. The coupon code podcast will save you 10%. If you want the best prep, that's the place to go. If you don't, there are plenty of other places you can go. Now, we're ready to rock. Sit back, relax. Fasten your seatbelt, no smoking in the cabin, enjoy the conversation with Derek Mills. 
And last but not least, let's have a quick word from our sponsors because without them, we wouldn't have this awesome podcast. Hey, Pilot, it's Nick. I want to tell you about a great friend of the show, Timothy P. Pope. He's a financial planner and he's completely focused on the professional pilot. He's the kind of guy you want to go to for real talk to help you figure out your financial future. With so many upgrades and so many transitions and so many things going on, you owe it to yourself to give him a call. He'll help you design and execute really smart financial planning strategies, whether it's retirement planning, investment management, military transition, tax planning. He's a great financial planning partner. Timothy P. Pope, CFP, helping professional pilots make the most out of life. Give him a shout. All the information's in the show notes. You should definitely tell him I told you to call. Okay, here we go. UPS interview prep. Good day. Why don't you introduce yourself? My name's Nick. Hey, Derek Mills. Derek Mills. Yeah. All right, Derek. Well, welcome to Big Brown. We're super glad you're in Louisville. Why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Yep. Born originally in Kansas City, Missouri, just for a couple months and moved to St. Louis, where most of my family is from. Luckily, I had a twin brother as well. I was born just after midnight. My mom changed birth certificate to share the same birthday as him. So I don't know what day I was actually born on, but here we are still standing in front of you today. But yeah, I live in St. Louis. My mom and my dad, she worked at McDonnell Douglas, which is also where my grandpa worked for over 50 years as an engineer designing airplanes. F-15 is kind of his baby. He's been kind of surrounded by that. My mom met my dad there, who was the FCF, the functional check flight pilot for the Harrier, when it was still McDonnell Douglas before Boeing bought him. So that's pretty interesting. Got to be you know around the Harrier since the day I was born and ended up flying it later on. Yeah, so that's where they met at work at McDonald Douglas on the, from the plant floor there. And then from there, we moved to Iwakuni, Japan, where I started school for three years with my brother as well, which is great to have kind of your best friends move around with you, take them where you go. So no matter where we went, I had a best friend wherever I went. It made it a lot easier to make friends as well. We were back to the States, grew up uh, around multiple bases, living on base, living off base. Same overseas as well. And then decided to go to the Naval Academy as I went through high school and I got through there. So it's the first time me and my brother split. He went to Florida State, went to Naval Academy, knew I wanted to be a Marine pilot, got selected for Marines, got selected for aviation. From there, went to TBS after graduating from the Naval Academy and then finally down to a flight school down in Pensacola, Florida. We had a five month wait, six month wait to start flight school. Asked the Marines down there to take time off and just become a firefighter for six months. So they said, absolutely. So I got to become a firefighter for six months, got my firefighter one qualification. He did that for six months. It was pretty sweet. Helping people out in the local community. Basically lived at the firehouse. I don't even know why I had a rent because I never lived at my own house while I was there. Finally started flight school. Got through that decently enough to uh, get selected for jets. And then from there, follow on through the Harrier training program in uh, North Carolina. After that, I got to go to my first fleet squadron out in Yuma, Arizona. And lucky enough to hit the squadron that was the next one out the door to go to Afghanistan, which is exactly what I signed up to do you know, about 10 years prior. So that was pretty sweet. To show up 10 months later, be a fully qualified wingman for day and night operations out there. Uh, did a lot of really good stuff as far as uh, supporting the Marines and the mission for Operation During Freedom. And came back about six months later, immediately started working up for our next deployment on the boat out to uh, Japan. Cruised all over the Western Pacific, doing a lot of operations with other countries in South Korea, Japan, Philippines, Thailand were the main ones that we were out at. From there, I came back and got selected to be a uh, Harrier instructor pilot. So we're back to the Harrier Training Squadron in Cherry Point. Instructed there for three years. Uh, did pretty well. Got selected for to be the one guy go over to the UK, be an RAF exchange pilot with the Royal Air Force, flying their Hawk T2s. Did that for three years. Probably the most amazing tour for me and my family out of all of the ones that I've done. It's flying their 100 aircraft formation over Buckingham Palace for their 100th anniversary. So 100 aircraft on the 100th anniversary over Buckingham Palace on international news. It's pretty sweet as like a non-Brit citizen, not, let alone not even in the Royal Air Force. Like, hey, we really want you to do this. I said, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Like, get in there, man. We want you. So got to do that and then came back to the States and then I had another tour in the Harrier Squadron as a maintenance officer, which is probably the most rewarding tour, working with all the guys on the shop floor and then up to the executive officer and then selected for uh, to command the uh, Harrier Training Squadron this past year. And I've been there ever since. So it's been most of my life, obviously, instructing two and a half tours now fully out of five uh, as an instructor. Truly have a passion for it. Love teaching. Got my son into it now. He's nine years old. He has his own logbook. We take it flying, cruise up and down the coast, all the Carolinas, get coffee in South Carolina, not just in North Carolina, move on from there. But really enjoy it. Love what I've done. Want to continue it. But most importantly, I want to be surrounded by good people when I do it. I really want a job that's going to enhance my life, just like the Marine Corps has and give me all these opportunities I've had. Not fit in, but actually enhance it. Do you think maybe UPS could offer that? What's that? Do you think maybe UPS could offer that? Yes. That, that's why I'm here. You will say it. Oh, so, yeah. And that's why I'm here in front of you today, because I honestly think this job 
which means this company holds a lot of the same values that I hold dear and is able to, no kidding, enhance my life with flying, with good people, and with growth. At UPS. Make sure you say, like, because it was oh, good, good, gotcha. good. And then you're like, I want to say event. the word UPS. Yes. Got it. Like, because, like, that could have been any airline. It was very good. Right. Could have been anybody. Okay. So I want to enhance myself, fly with, continue what I've been doing in the Marine Corps, flying with awesome, really great people. Yeah. Here at UPS. That's say the a, words, baby. Here, say it. That's like going out with a girl named Diana and Connor and Linda. Right. We don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's your feedback. Yeah. Right at five minutes. Okay. I knew it was long. Do you yeah. know why it's long? No. Why? It's your first part about your childhood. Okay. It was a minute and 45 seconds before you even got to TBS. Gotcha. Okay. So you can adjust and be careful how you adjust because okay. we're getting ready to go into this interview at what time? Five. It's how long? Hour and a bit. An hour and a bit. Yeah. Okay. So adjust slightly like you could go from talking about being a twin to your parents meeting on the floor and being a hairier guy to like fast forward i went to college and like find it like kind of jump a section of there that'll save you about 30 seconds got it and that's really all you need because it was right at five minutes it was good but i feel like i was rambling though that yeah i agree okay cool so i want you to think about that okay firefighter you love being a firefighter you wanted to do it yeah because why service service community yeah i love it and camaraderie it's like a ready room it is so yeah. say that like because they love what teamwork yeah camaraderie friendship like that's what you got out don't ramble i got out of there an amazing like the team was awesome we had such great camaraderie it was like being in the ready room where we all knew we could rely on one another move on okay royal air force was great love it buckingham palace is great Four minutes, you were talking about being a maintenance officer. Okay. So if you drop that 30 seconds out, that gives you a minute like, hey, I'm the commanding officer of the area training squadron, which is just kind of culmination of 20 years of effort. I'm so excited. I love what I get out of the Marine Corps. I love the men and women that I serve with and the excitement and the things we do. And I'm really looking forward to continuing that here at UPS because this is an unbelievable opportunity. I'm looking forward to answering any questions you might have. That's good. Yeah, I like that. You like that? Mm-hmm. That's why you pay me. Send it. Send it. Let's go. Okay. All right, moving on. Good job. Also, a couple, way to drop out the humor. Mm-hmm. Thank you for cutting out the humor. That was really a delicate dance there and right. way to go. A lot better. Okay. Keep it cool. If they're smoking and joking, yeah. don't say <laughs> Don't roll into cursing. Like, let them be the guy to curse. Right. I've seen it a couple times already from different companies. If they're like super relaxed and chill, let them be relaxed and chill. But you got a $10 million bill waiting for you. Right. That's it. So if it's your chance to reach out and get it. So do what it takes to get it. Right. That was a knife hand. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Solid. <laughs> All right. What was your most difficult job? I'd say my most difficult job was going to the Royal Air Force for three years. Having come off of my previous instructor tour, felt very comfortable in the airplane, felt very comfortable around the people I was with. You know, we knew kind of the level of a human or pilot that was coming through the system. We knew kind of their background. When they showed up, they were filtered through a process. There's a specific Harrier cut to get to the Harriers, the only one that really has that. So you usually kind of know where your students lie, where the kind of the starting point is. When I went to the UK, I went a step lower in the training pipeline to their advanced fast jet training. So from there, it's equivalent to T-38s or T-45s in the Air Force and Navy, respectively here. So from there, they get selected for whatever gray airplane, fleet airplane that they're going to fly. We were charged with A, graduating them from that syllabus and holding that standard for the fleet to make sure that people who arrived were ready, but then also streaming them to this particular platforms that they would be most successful in when they got there. So coming out of something where I did seven straight years of it, doing it and then turning around and teaching it and then only having three years to go over there to learn it, not only everything new, new rules of the road, new IFR procedures. I've never heard of basic service, traffic service and deconfliction service because VFR and IFR do not exist there. Those are the three different levels of how they, they fly. So to learn that to a level where I could immediately turn around and instruct it, not only in the airplane, but with their tactics as well that they were teaching was difficult for me. Being coming off an instructor tour where I was able to be the other person on the other side of the debrief room, standing up in front of the whiteboard talking, and now I'm in the chair receiving the debrief room. Wow, these are all the things I, A, didn't know existed in the world, B, why I'm doing it wrong, and C, how I'm going to get better. So 
that was the most challenging, but also turned out to be extremely rewarding to learn how to do that. Think about what I just did. And then how am I going to make sure that next guy does better than me when they go through this program, which immediately led to me becoming an instructor instructor. There was only four people in the entire base that were allowed to do that. So when they brought new instructors in, I was one of four guys who was allowed to train the next instructor core and cadre for the squadron by the time I left there. And that was, I truly feel like that initial first year of stress and difficult of learning something new led me all the way to that. And now I can apply that when I came back as an exchange officer, I now get exchanged the second way. So I did my exchange there with my Harrier stuff and I can brought that back and I exchanged the way we do things there. And I apply that in my own training squadron with my own instructors now at which I used to be one in my same training squadron. And now I can do that at UPS because I would love to be a flight instructor at UPS as well to do more for the company than just fly. I'm going to pivot you. No, I'm going to pivot you. Okay. I think that like you have conquered adversity in a dynamic environment with people of a different culture. Yeah. And like, that was really hard. Mm-hmm. And like this first year at UPS learning the aircraft, ah, learning the way they're yeah. doing it is going to be really hard. That's, yeah. You don't I'm need to worry about being an instructor. Don't go down that far. Okay. Be a receiver. Yeah. Like be the learner and like be ready to succeed there. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was, like, I was like, come on, that's it. Throw it no, this I've, way. I've thought about that a hundred times. Too. Yeah. 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 In a different vein of a story, but yeah. Yes. Okay. Cause usually they're going to come on and be like, all right, what do you think your troubles are going to be here? Well, I'll tell you it's all new. <laughs> it's all new <laughs> to learn, but here I am, but I've done it before. Why UPS? I believe UPS. Like I said in, earlier, I want to be, you know, surrounded by people who are really great to be with and work with that is indirectly and directly going to enhance my life and support the growth that we need as humans and as a business inside the cockpit, outside the cockpit and at home. So I think that's what attracted me initially to the Marine Corps. And that's also what's attracted me here to UPS as well with their drive for innovation, their holistic approach to supply chain solutions. Their Carol Tomei says, you know, better, not bigger through this e-commerce stuff that's going on right now as the the CEO and she's doing a great job as every quarter there's higher six percent this last quarter of growth i truly believe that and that's, that resonates with me in the marine corps as well so our kind of the smallest of the branches we tend to do less with more as we say a lot of times but i truly believe that if you have a core group of people who believe in what they do apply themselves appropriately and are supported in their efforts anything is truly possible and with that innovation mindset taking advantage of growth opportunities like covid just bought out only last week i believe from the largest italian healthcare provider, logistics provider, purchase. Now you have footprints in Latin America and Europe with the largest providers that's already there. If you're truly taking advantage of kind of these bad times, maybe in society, but good times for the market that we can positively influence for a better outcome overall. On top of that, on time on target is the life I've lived for my entire career. And I truly believe that. And that is absolutely at the end of the day, the way I will be involved in UPS is doing the exact same thing. We're going to take off on time. We're going to fly it safely. We're just going to ensure we're landing on time. Every time. All right. Back me up. Is that on time? Like the on time on target, like is part of the UPS thing, like always on time, something like that. Like what's the UPS mantra? Driving the world forward. This is why we're doing it. Yeah. Moving the world forward by delivering the manner. So what we decided was the vision statement was helping customers pioneer more sustainable solution, delivering packages more efficiently, creating more connections around the world and finding more ways to take action and give back. And we're going to make a modification with that answer. How are we going to modify it instead of on time and on target? How? What are you going to change? What we are you going to modify? Talk more about basically being the customer centric as far as like the Marine Corps being Marine Corps Brown. Marine Corps Aviation versus Marine Corps Brown. We're not the Air Force. We're not like shiny object in the Marine Corps. We're here to support the process and the mission of, of the ground elements in parallel. And then so if we lead it with our people, obviously, and it's driven by innovation and things that we do. And that is exactly why I agree with... That's why UPS, yeah. Yes, that's why UPS. Absolutely. So yeah. kind of finish that up. And so, all right, cool. Here we go. Describe CRM in your single engine environment. How do you use CRM in a single engine environment? CRM is very important to assure everything that we do is being done correctly to cover for any kind of threat error management processes that are in place for the company. So threat error management obviously is kind of what we kind of structure CRM around. CRM is more of the how to make sure that happens. Okay. So 
we want to avoid being like a bad situation. But before we get there, there might be some errors involved to drive us there. Before that, we maybe could plan around some things that could drive us to errors that could lead us to a bad situation. So it begins initially, you know, with just being able to brief and communicate with each other. Having the same SOPs is a big one to be able to do that. Now we're talking the same language. And I think that's probably the most important one to use as well. And I found that to be the most important in the seat cockpit. And the reason is because I'm not there to see and or do what's going on inside the cockpit for each person. In a flight of four that I'm leading, maybe, that can be a difficult task. It's, it's impossible. So what we do is we have a set of SOPs. We brief to those. We brief to today's points of friction. What I like to do as a flight lead is talk about today's points of friction because every day is going to be different in aviation. That's the beautiful thing about it. That's what makes it challenging. So today's points of friction, these are the things. Is it weather? Is it a threat? Is it a fuel state? Is it a new environment or runway that we're operating with? Is it a different country we're working in for communication via barrier? Could be anything. And then I like to brief what I like to call Derek's keys to success. All right. So right underneath the board, I write those. And these are in orange, usually kind of points of friction, like not necessarily bad yet, but we're rec- identifying them. And now we're going to keep ourselves from making these errors. And I like to brief keys to success. So depending on what that is for the day, we discuss those real quick, and then I tie those into the rest of the brief. So this is what's going to be different today about flying. So in a single seat, the best thing I can do initially is brief. And the next thing is going to be communicate effectively in the cockpit. And I call that C3, clear, concise, and correct communication. You need all three. Two of the three isn't going to get you to where you need to be. Okay, now let's bring that. GPS. Let's go. All like, right. Because you're going from you yeah, got to it. we. So translating that through the years, flying with multiple Middle Eastern countries as students when I was in the RAF. 30% of the students were not from the UK and did not use English as a first language. So it was truly an international kind of flying environment. For me at there, already listening to a different version of English. And then on top of that, with other students that did have it. And so trying to, to teach that and make sure they understood it taught me how to communicate better initially. And then also flying a two-seat airplane there was the first time that I really got to see what was going on between the front and the back seat and feeling the control inputs and doing that kind of stuff. So and learning something new at the same time while doing that. So learning a new airplane, a new environment. So I feel like that is set me up to know that I can be successful in a new environment with a multi-crew cockpit. Maybe this is a little bit different between instructor and student in that environment, but this is going to be more still life's a team sport. And that's how it's going to operate at UPS as well. So you can add that part about the RAF, but I think that you take that RAF part out and you take the UPS part and chunk it over to the first part of the answer. Because the first part of the answer was already really, really good about CRM. Okay. Okay. And then you wrap it up with like, and here we go. At the RAF, I was in a multi dual student aircraft, and now I'm like going into a flight deck, which is even more complex with a much more complex aircraft, multi engines, like all these things. But really, like, follow, like, relying on your CRM, that's the bedrock. It is straight up the bedrock of everything we do right. in the name of safety for success. And here we go. Right. So let's go ahead and do it. And, like, that's it. So your cool, your awesome story about CRM. And then chunk out the RAF part. Bring in the, like, here we go into a flight deck at UPS. Complex aircraft. Bedrock CRM. And this yep. is it. So you're just tying it together to UPS. Mm-hmm. What do you think? See a trend here. Yeah, but you can't be a f- moron about it. Right. Like, you've got to be able to be conversational and engaging like you are without sounding like a robot. That's the threat. Right. And I don't want, like, let's think about it, right? Did I already say this about, I, I've been saying this all day, so I, mean, I don't know if I said this here or not. The experience, they're asking you this question to ver- validate that you have experience in the thing. You have experience dealing with the conflict. You have experience dealing with CRM. You have experience with whatever. You can validate that. Now, how do you use what you've learned from that, right? Like we talk about. Yep. But then the bigger essay picture is not about you. Nobody gives a about you. They give a about the company and making the company more money. And you give a about that too. And so you're pointing yourself to them. You're bringing them self covering you with no difficulty. Like it's clear that you are UPS and that's how you're answering. Okay. But it's tricky. Like this is good because it's like we're having to deal with noise in the background and still be articulate and you're keeping good eye contact you're smiling you should be relaxed keep it up these are good answers on being it's 354 you got five o'clock yeah okay track it. is the length of the answer appropriate what's the, that the length of the answers is that yes cover don't, all the bases don't worry about the length of the answers okay i will tell you if you need to think about the length of the okay. answers this is not a time event this right. is like plus it's the end of the day they're gonna be super cool give me cj will get you out of there yeah man all right, you're departing from Ontario. 
California with terrain to the north and the east. LAX traffic is there and there's bad visibility. What are your thoughts going through this? I'm immediately think about threat and error management here. So you just listen to the threats. Uh, immediately think about threat and error management here. You just listen to the threats that almost always existent out in LA. So are we taking off to the east or the west? So if we're taking off to the east, kind of directly into the terrain, we're going to be out of options pretty quickly if our assumptions are not validated, i.e. if we have an engine failure right after takeoff. So we are assuming everything's going to be good, but we're ready if it's not. So first thing is going to be knowing that our, our V1 speed is coming up and adhering to the company policy and FAA policy on how to deal with that. So once we pass that V1 speed, we're going to commit that to being an airborne emergency, but we now need to be aware of the new threats that are there inside this non-sterile environment that we're operating in. So ideally, if you take off, continue to accelerate, climb up, clean up, accelerate, get above, you know, maintain direction control, go ahead and rotate, clean up, accelerate, turn down wind, in accordance with whatever the SOP currently is at UPS, I'm not there yet, but in conduct the appropriate landing in accordance with the emergency procedures for an engine out issue. It's kind of the big thing I'm thinking at because we need climb performance, but we also have bad weather back in the field. So now where do we turn back to the fields or do we go away? We need to declare an emergency. There's a lot of traffic around that doesn't mean they automatically part the Red Sea. If there's other metal in the sky, you got to still have to deal with that even if you are an emergency aircraft. So those are the things I'm immediately thinking about through the threat and air management. And this clearly is in the high threat portion of the company's you know threat and air management model and the, the takeoff anything below MSA, we're going to climb as well. And we're hoping to go fly and assuming we got two engines to make that happen. We're now degraded state in a less than optimal environment. We're going to need to make just something about it. You turn this thing into an entire single engine scenario. Right. It could be or could not be. There could be other, there are other things that we need to think about. Okay. okay. So the first thing I'm thinking about is like, okay, if I lose an engine on takeoff, I know there's a lot of complexities and right. we're going to make sure that if there's an engine out procedure that the company has, yeah. I'm going to follow that and make sure we brief it. We're going to go through everything that we would do in case we would be aware of that. If we have terrain and we're going to be under positive control, but there's a lot of VFR traffic as well. We're going to make sure we have our heads out. We're going to be looking at our TCAS to right. verify where aircraft are. We'll have a good scan going there and make sure that we understand that if we have a SID. Yeah, I'll say, yeah, fly the ATC procedures first. If you can't comply with that, then start backing it up with some other things. Yes. Get yourself out of the fact that we're single engine. I moved okay. on from the engine loss. Gotcha. I'm thinking other things we're thinking of. Like, yeah, there's an engine loss that we're thinking okay. of. But the other things we're thinking of, because it doesn't say anything about... Right. Engine loss. Engine loss. Yeah, but just, that's one of the things. That would keep... Yeah. Engine loss is one of the things. So don't get wrapped up in just engine loss. Got it. Okay. Other things. Do you need a pen? Here. You want to write? Here. Just take this book. I need all these cards. I got this. You got that? Yeah, right here. Okay. We're taking notes, y'all. You're doing great, bud. Donnie just got out of the UPS. That's where I was. Tell him to come here. Yeah. He's come to give me the lowdown. Yeah. Well, he's going to sit here and give us all the lowdown. Engine out. VFR traffic. VFR traffic. Look, terrain. Uh, terrain. TCAS. Weather radar. Weather radar. Terrain radar. Terrain radar. Well, terrain. The terrain, terrain, terrain button radar. is your radar. Yeah. The, it's not a radar. Like, it's an, a graphical overlay. So, okay. it's not that important. Lost Tom. Yeah. Well, no. no. Just fly the route. Flying the departure. Yeah. yeah. Flying the departure. Making sure we have our frequencies preset. And most importantly, briefing to it. Briefing to it. And like briefing out all the particulars with that. And that's probably it. Yeah. They're contingencies. Got to brief the contingencies. All the contingencies. Yeah. When your boy shows up, have him grab that chair right there. And we'll we'll pull right. him over. And we'll, yeah, we'll put him right here beside you. Okay. Cool. You want to brief us in? Or uh, approach? Yeah. Yeah, I do actually. All right. So... We have the Louisville, Kentucky ILS for only three five left. And you're gonna brief that thing up to me. Looking at chart eleven TAC four on the Jefferson plates, dated twenty four January of twenty and effective on thirty of January for Louisville, Kentucky. So I see the ILS to runway three five and it's three five left. We've got eight is already. We've got the approach to dialed in the column one tower backed up. The localizer frequency is one zero nine dot three five. Put a final approach course of three five zero degrees and glide slope is its cardinal twenty four hundred feet. For the ILS, we'll bring it down here to the minimums, and we're shooting any of them. Which category? We're all, almost always Cat One, unless we decide that the weather's bad enough that we need to be Cat Two or Cat Three. So minimums. the Cat say just say, and we're gonna have Cat One minimums of Cat One minimums of eleven hundred feet for the MDA, and yep, six hundred thirty-six feet set for decision height itself. That's this line correct right up here. That's all we need, not C and D. Yeah, so eleven hundred feet. You just say eleven hundred feet is our decision height, and that's in is our MDA. Yeah. And then move on. Airport's at. Oh, got it. Airport elevation is 501. Touchdown elevation is uh, 464 with an MSA of uh, 3,600 feet. Uh, for those. 
Did we come down to the approach? We don't walk through this first? No, you don't need to walk okay. through that. Okay. Once we break out, we expect to see the pappies on the left-hand side with pulsive to lighting. In the case of a misapproach, uh, we're going to climb straight ahead to 1,600 feet. We'll start a left-hand turn to 3,000 feet. It'll be direct to Damon from there and hold as GPS required. Yeah. So when you go from your pappies and your alpha twos, instead of reading this, just jump up here and read, read it verbatim. verbatim. Got it. Don't even bother. For the notes, RNAV1 GPS required, DME or radar is required. Also, circling runway, one minute authorized at night. Simultaneous approach is authorized, and the visual glide slope, intercept, and ILS glide path are not coincident for those. That's important to see. The note when we do break out, you're not going to see two reds or two whites over two reds. On okay. Piece. What's our glide slope? Glide slope is three degrees, but it's offset from the path. Love center. it. Love it. Very good. Did you say glide slope already? I didn't yeah. hear it. I'm oh, sorry. I yeah, so out. Gl- yeah, up here it says VGSI angle is the three degrees to the height of 75 feet. Perfect. Okay. Now, you want bonus points? Yeah. Pop over to the taxi diagram. Okay. And tell me the taxi. Where are we taxiing to? So this is, ooh, where is Miami? Maybe I need to update it. <laughs> Miami? No, there's a button you can push on here. All right. So we're going to look at, you're not going to be at the concourse. You're going to be a kind of in the UPS parking area. So what I do is like, okay, I talk about the fact that, yeah. Oh, you know what we didn't talk about? Holding? No. Well, you talked about the missed approach. Okay. All right. So you're going to talk about three, five left. You're going to talk about the runway length, if it's a displaced threshold or not, because it is. And then if you have the ability there's another button you can push to switch over my i need to update my jump so it doesn't have the clear thing but we got eleven thousand eight. you can just say we got eleven eight eight and seven to land we're gonna be landing we'll be off on bravo six and then taxi to the gate for towers instructions doesn't look like i see any hot spots unless we have to cross one 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 yeah no landing hole short or anything like that yeah visibility all that and so don't drill too far down into it just don't even save this place threshold eleven eight eighty seven and then we are going to taxi off get to a hot spot that's a good brief. Any questions on that? No. You're doing a good job. It's very, it's very straight. simple. It's super yeah. simple. Yeah. Come on this side. We got somebody else joining us here. We're going to shift out of this mock interview. We're going to get him some headphones. Huh? What's up? Hey, hey buddy. You? Can you hear us? Yes. All right. Introduce yourself. Hey, name's James Pruden. Harrier pilot in the Marine Corps right now. Oh, more we'll Harrier pilots? Heck yeah. It's all UPS wants. <laughs> okay. So what'd you just do? Tell us. Just an interview with UPS. All right. It was awesome. Dump it. Let's hear it. So just like what you got on Spitfire. So if you read the trip reports, it was just like that. You know, nothing new for me though. So get the read through all those if you have one coming up. If you uh, do any of the interview prep for the PIC and stuff, like flawless for it. So run through any of those. It's great. So if you got time. Obviously, you don't. You get one. Up. So, lay it on them. Tell them what to expect. So, you walk in, and uh, you got Katie and Larry are there for you. Sit down and met both of them, and they introduce themselves, and then you go right into your intro after that. You can ask questions, too. Cool. Yeah, and then it just runs through all the same questions. Tell me time. Tell me, do the situation. And all the same ones that were on every single other trip reports. From Did you brief an approach? Yep. Did that. Did you do this? 3-5 left. Okay. At Louisville. Cool. So what, tell me about the time questions that you get. That you had a conflict with a coworker that you had a job like right now. Sorry. Oh, good. I need to have the, the profile opened up. What's that? I need one of those trip reports. Oh, no, here no. you go. I'll give you. I got them all right here. You can scroll oh, through. Nice. Yes, yeah, so you have to give the approach free. Enter holding. It's just pictures, screenshots. Oh, okay. Did have to describe CRM and what it means to you or CP? You got the fuel problem, so the 30,000 pounds they have burn 10,000 uh, per hour, 30 minutes to your destination, 10,000 on deck. How much time do you have to hold to wait? About an hour and a half, is that right? Yep. A little less probably to make a decision. Yeah, they just look for an hour and a half. Hour and a half is just like, they just do the math. Do the math. Yep. Got it. Math in public. That's awesome. Yeah. Marines did it. Oh, yeah. I got something to show you guys in a minute. Obviously, of course, why UPS? Actually, didn't get any fatigue questions, didn't get anything about night flying. Might be because I brought some of that stuff up as I was going through the about me. So met the mark for it. Did not ask me about the where I want to be domiciled or where I want to fly. I did mention, though, that I would like to do more long haul stuff and just go away for 12 days, 12, 14 days and come back and have time off. So it might have been a check for that. What do you see about UPS that excites you? Like going back to the light UPS, but it's more of like start feeding, you know, all the, the great stuff that they're doing with their film doctor programs and what they're trying to do for the environment. So we had to throw that in there. Have your own twist. I do. That's different. Roger. Yeah. Yeah, don't be me. Neither of you gave me. 
how did you deal with conflict or a, a person that you didn't get along with? You'll have that one. Or I did. Yeah. Is that the same as conflict with a coworker? Yep. Don't talk about, like, it's a softball answer, right? We're best friends. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Okay. There was something on that I am starting going to Latin for Mission Crossing time. So my slice of cheese ended up being time management. So talk okay. about that for the threat and error management. This is the first time there's ever been a hot new guy walking out, not a hot new guy, but like a dude walking out of an interview with a guy getting ready to walk into an interview with a coach yeah. talking about interviews. Like this Call like, next play. Don't drop the handoff. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, I feel like Pete Rose here. <laughs> uh, I definitely did this. The ramble on part here happens. My intro is probably like 10 minutes. Your intro is 10 minutes. I, I didn't time it, but it was long as a test pilot. He's a lot to talk about. <laughs> Got tons of stuff to talk about. I, I, have, stuff in my life. I have an astronaut with a less than six minute intro. He needs us to do it a little bit longer because he graduated and did something else besides coming back to the Harrier. <laughs> <laughs> they seem like we'll find good. Out, <laughs> yeah. Do they pass out? I also didn't wear the uh, bold tie, so I screwed that up too. You're fine. You don't have a lapel pin. No. Thank God. I saw a few of those yesterday. I want to punch every one of those dudes. Yeah. I feel like they need to have to have a line of people to punch, and they just line up and I punch them. I hate my pill pins. <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst. Where's all your flair? You, uh, yesterday you had all sorts of fun. I know. It's a long day. I've been getting stickers. Maybe I'll put these Air Force tattoos on. I think they're yes. tattoos. What else, Donnie? Yeah, you had to, I'm just trying to go through all these. It's like, oh, then you feel like I take off so the same fun of cleanup accelerate. Emergency downwind. You have the yaw, of course. Uh, yeah. Center line. Cool. And then, yeah, the standard question at the end. Check right failures, DUIs, yeah. Yeah. prior yeah. questions. Yeah. Yep. Do you have any failures? Anything hard to talk about? Low grades? In college? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Barely got in, barely got out. Okay. <laughs> I want you to say it with humility and not with jokiness when you tell it. Okay. That's important. Yeah. About learning and like, because like succeeding, right? Like, yeah, not taking things seriously and then becoming the guy, the man that you are and yeah. like everything that you stand for and every, all of that is okay. the most important part of the story. Okay. They ask about your grades? Nope. Never came up. We have, Even for the, both uh, have pretty low grades, I think. Yeah. Did you also, well, undergraduate initially graduate? Listen, good. I'm good. I issue all forms of education. So <laughs> I've never been a number one out of any squadron. I've never had JPME, any of it, no masters, like no middle school, like none of it. At least you're eating M&Ms on a podcast. I can hear you're crunching M&Ms. This is how Marines go. What else? What do you think? Yeah. Uh, so when they asked about the check ride failures, I did have some, so but it's just kind of dry. Had this, that happened. And as it, it didn't ask what I learned from it or anything like that. Moving on right to the next thing. Oh, yep. I saw that in your uh, paperwork. Saw that in your paperwork. All right, good go. That's they, interesting. They're just like ready to like check it off the block and move on. Yeah. I mean, I did write up a little paragraph in my app, so maybe they already had enough information for that. They're like, okay, got it. But they didn't ask anything about, about it specifically. You could certainly, like, if you mention it and there's a weird, awkward silence, like, would you like me to kind of go into that a little bit? Because I'm happy to chat about it. But you don't have any failures. Never mind. Yeah. They asked where else I applied to. What'd you say? That? Well, I told them that I applied to Delta and actually, like, I gave them the whole spiel. Like, I applied, like, I was like, I don't want to say this. Like, shouldn't say this in an interview, but I'm just being honest that uh, I applied to Delta. Like, Delta was my number one. And like, if I got a CGO there, like, I wasn't even going to look anywhere else because I'm moving back to Minnesota. And everything I hear is you want to be live where you be down, sell that. And that's the best quality of life. And, and then I told them that I wised up, you know, after, uh, like, failing the initial assessment with Delta. Now, like, if, grown to like, absolutely love you know going to cargo it's, for me it looks like it's not recession proof but weather recession a little bit better than some of the passenger lines could that you get a much better opportunity to pick up you know, wide body aircraft as a captain in five and a half years at UPS and I'll never make that at my age for Delta you know I could get it at 62 maybe 63 not that that's a bad thing it's you know, there's a great life as a captain for any other aircraft too but it's, and then I also talk about you know, the pay scales for it so that UPS one pay scale Nick, you're first officer at the time or captain at the time and it doesn't matter what platform you're on so you're not chasing that game at all so I was just being honest with where I stand now and they asked like when my availability is and I told them November 3rd is early so they're like wink wink I heard uh, there's a 8 November class so if I can do that it'd be good and then that's basically where it ended we were out of time so it's like strictly at least for me like there's people after me so it's like one hour to the minute so you didn't have a it was an hour full hour and it took you know, every minute of it, but got kicked out at the end of the hour. So, did you get any verbal cues that it was good? 
Well, I mean, they seem like they're smiling, laughing the whole time, so it's that seemed good. Obviously, you don't know what they're really thinking. They could be like, this guy's rambling on, saying all sorts of weird crap. Like, nope, do not want him. Any idea when you'll hear back? Uh, they said it takes up to 90 days, but they said typically when they, like, they know they want to, like, give people their information, so they're trying to keep it within two weeks. And they said either way, whether I got it or not, I'll know within two weeks what they're expecting. So. All right. So time will tell. Thank you. Hey, uh, speaking of that, did you stop by American? You probably didn't, did you? That's tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, they've got this like Marine Corps advertisement thing going on. They got like a whole bunch of crayons. And oh yeah, nice. I'm hungry. It's for the Marines. <laughs> you better eat up. It's like a Marine Corps snack bar, dude. I'm out of M and M's. I need some. A bunch of crayons and coloring books. Yeah, it's beautiful. All right, cool, man, dude. Thank you for coming by. You good? You got any more questions before? I mean, we can keep pressing. Do you want to work on any of these? Yeah, we'll do a conflict with the cover. Yes, we'll that's that. a good one. Yeah. Yep. You can stick around. You can roll whatever you want to do, man. I'm a lesson. All right. Tell me about a time you had a conflict with a coworker. So quite a few, not in a bad way, just, you know, in the form of you know, what we do and for a living, you know, you're always going to run through that. And the big thing with conflicts, especially with coworkers, is to keep the bigger picture in mind as far as where we are, who we are, and where we're trying to go. And so in this particular instance, it was uh, another squadron commander. We had, were flying our jets back home from uh, an exercise in California back to North Carolina. Uh, we'd been out there for a few weeks, seemed to be like a little bit get home itis kind of pressure and make sure everything kind of went very swimmingly as well for everybody who was involved. And one of the aircraft took off in Amarillo, Texas, one of, one of the last days, trying, one of the last aircraft getting out that day. And it had some severe vibrations, basically, immediately after takeoff, passing through about 800 feet. So the pilot elected to go through the engine vibration procedure, at which point the vibration ceased. He put it down on the deck. They landed it right after that. So the next day, we had the maintenance guys roll in that night. They were coming back from California. They stopped in Amarillo and they wanted to check out. They wanted, obviously, to check this jet to make sure if there were anything major wrong with it and if there was what needed to be done. So they stopped, checked it out. They couldn't find anything wrong with it. A screw here or there that maybe need to be tightened. And then low powered the jet a few times, ran it up to a higher RPM as well, do a semi high power run. Couldn't find anything wrong with it and then elected to go fly it again to see kind of if that changed anything. So took off again the next morning, uh, exact same thing happened, same pilot, same issue, executed the same emergency procedure, turned around and landed. He's done flying. He needed to go home for something else. And so I'm now back. I just gotten back the previous day flying another airplane. Commander wanted them to go, one of my guys from our squadron to go fly that jet home because these guys had just gotten back and they were kind of on, on leave after being gone for so long. I didn't really like that idea because we had, we were gone for a decent amount of time with them as well. I elected being one of the functional check flight pilots and one of the three. I wasn't going to ask somebody else to do that. So ready for deployment. And one of the highest qualified maintainers is in the shop and he's got all the qualifications in his shop. And he also likes to race dirt bikes. So he's doing backflips on a dirt bike and breaks his back about four weeks before we deploy. CO was heartbroken basically because he was the one guy with all the qualifications. He was kind of our glue that held that shop together. Very difficult to replace. So he was pretty upset about it. And we had to go find somebody else to replace him on this deployment. As the maintenance officer at the time, he really wanted me to find that. And so we're four weeks away. We're going to be asking somebody to go. I think we'll be able to train in-house, grow from this internally with the people that we have. We have some hungry people and I think they're ready to do this. He was a bit of the opposite mindset. And I actually want to do some, take him to non-judicial punishment, which is like, no kidding, get this guy in like, a bit of trouble, administrative trouble in the Marine Corps, not actual, no kidding trouble. And I didn't really agree with that because at the same time, you watch ESPN right now and the X Games and every commercial is Marine Corps because they, they really want guys who do backflips on dirt bikes to come out. That's where we want to attract. That's the guy I want to go on this deployment with. And it's okay if he can't make it, but there's five more like him just underneath him that he has had an influence on. And I want to train them to be that next replacement, which is how we should in my opinion, operate. So making everybody better than we were. So I was able to talk him out of that, which was nice. It's enough that he trusted me to do that on deployment. And then while we went through the deployment, that we came home with more calls than we left with. And he even got to go with us on our next deployment as well as the senior guy again. So all worked out. I was entrusted to uh, make that training happen and we actually made it work. Okay. So let's get back to the conflict. Okay. The fact of the matter is like we had this disagreement. What's the point of this question is kind of see how you handle, handle disagreement. Like that. We were able to have this conversation. I felt comfortable approaching him about the fact that like, he was just doing what he's been seeing. He's kind of a product of his environment. Right. And to get the guy in trouble is a little bit of insult to injury, literally. Right. right? And so once this other dude sees eye to eye with you, like, and he accepts it, like, 
we're able to, this Marine's able to succeed. Everybody's able to move forward together. And you guys, you guys have retained your relationship. You've maintained CRM, right? Together, even though you're not in the aircraft. And you've showed that you can disagree, but come to a logical conclusion that is most been, that is the most beneficial and the safest and the, like, the, the most efficient. At UPS, you're going to be confronted with conflict and they're like, you know, you'll be confronted with like difficulty and you'll have to make decisions based on the information at hand. And it's always important to work together. And that is kind of what the beauty is at UPS and what you're looking forward to. Right. Maybe, yeah. maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to wacky drop in. You want to change ID tags, Check some what? switch ID tags and we'll, I'll go in. I'll go do UPS. I just want the first year's, second year's paycheck. They don't let helicopter guys in the UPS. Okay. So the conflict store, I like this one better. But I want you to bring out that conflict a little bit yep. and talk about the resolution clearer. Yes. And how you're resolving that together. Yep. And tie that in. Like, because in the Marines, like we are one team. We can certainly disagree and have a difference of opinions. But I didn't feel like hanging somebody out to drive for trying to do what the Marines are like actually advertising was right. the most effective use of our yeah, it's kind of two point. Number one, protect him, number two, build within. Yes, that and say that. Within. This yeah. is a two part two thing. part problem. Yeah. Number one. Yeah, take care of my guy. Number two, deal with the problem. Yeah, and build it from within. Not ask for better, not bigger. Yeah, right. Exactly. So that's how we kind of chew on that a little bit. I like that. It's a good story. You should be proud of that story. That's a good one. Hey, before I let you go, I need to mention one thing because a lot of people are asking me, can you do anything? Can you help me with this? And the answer is yes. At Spitfire Elite, we will make more millionaires this year than Major League Baseball will make in the next five years. Our company actually does this. It's called Spitfire Elite Interview Consulting. And you can find us over at SpitfireElite.com. Our clients, they call us the easy button for interview prep because everything you need to crush your interview is there in one spot. Whether it's application review or interview prep, All of it is covered. We've helped thousands of clients who are now flying at their dream jobs because our coaches gave them the one-on-one feedback that they needed to succeed on the biggest day of their life. The best part of Spitfire is our community. All Spitfire clients will get access to our private chats where they can work with each other and they can work with our coaches and get the latest information on all the airlines. If you'd like to make sure that you are 100% ready to go on your big day, there is only one choice. Everything you need is in one place, and I think it's pretty affordable. You'll have to take a look for yourself. Just go over to SpitfireElite.com and check us out. Use the coupon code PODCAST and it'll save you 10%. And by the way, I will see you on the next episode. The statements made on this show are my own opinions and do not reflect, nor are they under any direction from my employer.